All right, good afternoon or good morning or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to this month's INCORE Connect and Explore webinar. Today, our spotlight will include three presentations for you. The first one is Global Ideas for US Solutions. The second one is Improving Childhood Obesity Policy, Cultural Insights on Diet Discrimination and Food Systems. And the third one is the state of childhood obesity. And after these presentations, we will have time for Q&A with the speakers. And we will also wrap up with a few announcements at that time from NCOR. I am your moderator for today's panel. My name is Karen Hilliard. And I'd like to introduce you to the distinguished speakers that we have for you today. The first one is Karobi Acharya, and Dr. Acharya is a public health anthropologist who has worked on international health and development issues for over 20 years across 10 countries. She currently directs the Global Ideas and U.S. Solutions Portfolio at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And this portfolio learns how other countries are achieving health and well-being for all members of society and then adapts them to improve health and well being in the United States. Our next guest is Ted Fisher. And Dr. Fisher is the Cornelius Vanderbilt Professor of Anthropology and Health Policy at Vanderbilt University, where he also directs the Cultural Context of Health and Well Being Initiative. And his work looks at food, health, and culture. And his new book is called Making Better Coffee, How Maya Farmers and Third Wave Tastemakers Create Value. Next, we have Tatiana Paz Lemus. And Dr. Lemus is also from the Vanderbilt Cultural Context of Health and Wellbeing Initiative, where she is the program manager. And she received her PhD in anthropology from Vanderbilt University and currently resides in Guatemala City. And her focus is on well being, agency, and the lives of Indigenous youth in rural Guatemala. At last, we have Jamie Bus uh, Bussell, who is a senior program officer at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And she is deeply committed to discovering, learning, and exploring cutting edge ideas with the potential to help build a culture of health and ensure that all children and families have what they need to thrive. She serves as the lead on the foundation's efforts to prevent childhood obesity. And uh, for today, I wanna to remind you before we start the presentations that if you have a question for any of our speakers during the webinar, please do write it using the Q&A feature on the bottom of the screen. So use the Q&A button rather than the chat button. And if you need technical assistance at any time, you can use the chat box for that. Um, so let us know if you have any trouble. And if you have problems accessing the webinar, if you get bumped out and need to get back in, you can email us at incore at fhi360.org and we will work with you there to resolve the problem. So if you have any questions, please add them to the Q&A box as we go through the webinar today. And we will come to those at the end of our presentations. I also want to note that today we are going to be tweeting the webinar from at Incor, uh, uh, and, or excuse me, the, um, from our Incor Twitter account, which is at Incor. And to join that conversation, you can use the hashtag ConnectExplore. So that our speakers will know a little bit more about all of you and who is in the audience, we would like to take a quick poll before we get underway today. So there are going to be two questions that come up, and we would appreciate all of you who can answer these for us. The first one is, how do you categorize your role? Are you a practitioner, a researcher, a student? or do you consider yourself uh, to have some other type of role related to today's topic? So that's the first question. And in a moment, we will 
reveal the answers so that you will also know who else is in the audience. So if everyone can just take a moment to answer, go ahead and indicate on the screen, practitioner, researcher, student, or other. I'll give you just one more moment to respond. So counting down, three, two, and one. And we can reveal the results of that poll. So as you can see, um, we are, the, the bulk of um, folks are either practitioners or researchers today, about half of you, um, about 25% approximately of each. And then we have students in the audience who make up about 13% of the audience. And also uh, about 36% of our audience considers themselves to have another role here. And we, we'd love to hear from you in the chat about what that role is and just to give our, our presenters an idea again of how they can be most helpful to you in the presentations that they make. So please let us know. And we have a second poll question that we would like to ask as well. And this one is whether in the past month or how many of these activities you have done, which of them you have done in the past month, and you can select all that apply for this question. The first one is tried a new food from another culture, traveled to a different country, read a book or a novel about another culture, attended an event to celebrate another culture, made a new friend from another culture, or watched a movie in a different language. So if these apply to you, please check all that apply. And we'll give you just a moment to respond to this as well. All right, let's go ahead and wrap up the polling and see what the results look like. Aha, so we have quite a few people, about 76% of you who indicated that sometime in the last month you tried a new food from another culture. Um, about 12% traveled to a different country. Maybe that would be a little bit higher if we, we weren't still battling COVID. Um, but we also see that about 40% of folks have read a book or novel about another culture. 22% attended an event to celebrate another culture. 35% made a new friend from another culture, and 42% have watched a movie in a different language. So very good. That's, uh, it's excellent to know how all of you are, are reaching out and learning, and today's presentations are going to just take that one step further. Um, so again, we're very excited to welcome all of our panelists today, and thank you, thank you so much for being here. We're ready for our program, and I am going to turn it over to our first speaker of the day, Karobi Acharya. Thanks so much, Karen, um, and thank you for having me. Um, I wanted to begin uh, our session today with a land acknowledgement. Um, I wanted to take the opportunity to recognize and acknowledge that Philadelphia, where I'm based, is the ancestral lands of the Lenape people, also called Lanai Lenape, the traditional stewards of what is now Delaware, New Jersey, Eastern Pennsylvania, and Southern New York. The Lenape were the first tribe to sign a treaty with the United States. Despite many Lenape being forcibly removed from their ancestral homes and located to Western states, the Lenape's presence and resilience in Pennsylvania continues to this day. This land acknowledgement is one small act to pay respect and honor the original caretakers of this land from time immemorial until now and into the future. Recognizing the histories of land theft, violence, erasure, and oppression that have brought us here. 
If you would like to share uh, and recognize uh, the land where you are located, please feel free to do so in the chat. And you'll see that Song has posted a link if you're, if you're not aware or not sure of, uh, of what land uh, you are located on. So thank you for that. Uh, next slide, please. So I thought we could just uh, take a minute for, for me to just share a little bit about the global ideas for US solutions work um, and, um, and why we were interested in supporting the cultural context of health work that uh, Ted and Tatiana are gonna share with us today. So next slide. So what's bread? That's that that's a, a, a question. So to some people, bread is sliced, comes in a plastic bag like this, labeled with nutritional facts. This particular loaf has, uh, and, and in this case, bread comes in a loaf. Uh, this particular one has 90 calories per slice with three grams of protein and about 19 grams of carbohydrates. That's what bread is to, to some people, people like nutritionists or people who are maybe counting their calories. Um, next slide. So uh, I want you to just take a minute, and yes, the slide is blank, it's blank on purpose. I want you to just take a minute and think about bread in your life. What images come to mind? What memories? Uh, feel free to add them in the chat. What, are, what, what comes to mind to you uh, when you think of bread and what bread is in your life? So feel free, go ahead and, and add, add, you know, what are the smells, what are the tastes, what are the memories that come to mind? Um, add those in. And if you uh, just click on the slide. Your father, homemade, I love that. Milk and coffee. Um, can we just click on the slide? Yeah, thank you. So uh, these are a couple of things that came to my mind as I thought about as I thought about bread. They, you know, they're used for sandwiches. I think about baking together. They're usually shaped like squares, although the photo has an olive, all, uh, oval shape. Um, bread is often used in communion. It has a highly symbolic value in in many religious traditions. So if you click on the next slide, please. I love I love reading all these. This is great. So let's let's think about chapati for a minute. So chapati is a Hindi word that is often translated as bread. The nutritional value is about the same as bread. It's about 13 carbohydrates, about three grams of protein. But the experience of chapati, the images, the memories, the meaning if, of chapati is completely different. Chapatis are made every day, usually, and not in an oven, but on a griddle, and they're made at home. Uh, there isn't a communal uh, a sense of making bread. Uh, you don't eat chapati with coffee very often, unless maybe you're in South India, it's more of a tea thing. Uh, chapati is used as a tool to eat. You scoop food up with a chapati. You don't tend to do that with bread so much. Um, there is a whole constellation or web of meaning around chapati that's very different from bread. And these webs of meaning impact how we think about foods, about these foods, but really about any food. And this in turn influences how we think about food policy and about the relationships between people and food. So Ted and Tatiana will go into far more detail about the implications of this. Um, so if you could go to the next si slide. Um, I just wanted to share, as I said, a brief uh, bit about the global ideas for US solutions work um, that is supporting the, the cultural context of health work. Um, we believe good ideas have no borders. The global team focuses on learning from how other places improve health and well being and bringing those ideas here to the US. And one of the impacts of global learning is, it, is that it makes the implicit explicit. We begin to see the ocean that we're swimming in. And so we were really excited to support the cultural context of health work by Vanderbilt as a way to focus on how culture, those webs of meaning, impact our health. Uh, so I'll turn it to you, Ted. Thanks. 
Thanks so much, Karobi. It's a uh... Always a treat to hear you talk. I hate going after Karobi because she's such a, she gives such wonderful examples. Uh, as Karobi said, what we want to, uh, we're we're in the midst of a project that's supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the Global Ideas for U.S. Solutions, and it's it's part of a uh, what we're going to present on today is part of a larger project that's trying to see how we can better integrate social and cultural aspects and insights into health policy and clinical care. I think there's a widespread belief, a realization that this is important these days, but it's proven difficult to actually work some of these ideas into policy solutions. And we're trying to bridge that gap uh, and specifically focused on childhood obesity. And we hope, Tatiana and I hope in our presentation today to complicate. I know you all have thought about obesity a lot and childhood obesity a lot, but we hope to complicate your views uh, in the way in which ours uh, were complicated in doing this research. When we started, we thought this was going to be a pretty clear-cut uh, project. There is a global epidemic of childhood obesity. Rates have quadrupled since the 1970s. And this is due, at least according to the standard energy balance model, to more calories consumed than expended. And that, in turn, is related to changes in diet and physical activity, which are areas where cultural insights are fundamental for improving uh, policy and, and clinical care. Next slide, please. Uh, since the 1990s, when the epidemic word started being used uh, around obesity and childhood obesity, there have been massive public health campaigns around the world to try and tackle this problem. Uh, and I'm going to mention today some of we, Tatiana and I will mention today some of the very cool and innovative solutions. You see here a map of some of the examples that we documented in our report. But overall, rates continue to rise apace. So something's not working. Uh, and we think that the cultural insights uh, can, can help address that. So today, Tatiana, Tatiana and I want to give an overview of our work. We recently published a report on this and focus on our three main conclusions. Next slide, please. And those are, one, that food is more than nutrition. This is something we realize. This is something that Karobi just vividly drove home for us that food is a vehicle for nutrients, certainly, but that's not its only value to people. And it's often not what is forefront in people's minds as they're making food choices. Most people make their dietary decisions around cultural norms, religious or moral strictures, personal taste, economic constraints, and so on. Uh, and effective health policy needs to engage and build on these cultural values rather than seeing them just as an obstacle to be overcome. So food is more than nutrition. The second is that health is more than weight. Uh, in clinical care and population studies, children classified as overweight or obese are often reduced to this single aspect of their health. It, there are certainly risks uh, associated with, uh, with certain types of body fat. We all know that. That's the reason we're, we are here today. Uh, but we want to uh, emphasize that weight discrimination also results in poor health outcomes. And we need to balance our attention to the physiological effects and the social, cultural, and psychological implications. Third, diet is about more than individual choice. We often focus on individual diets and in turn on individual self-control. Uh, but in fact, the choices that we face when we're, when we're making our, our food decisions are framed by cultural and commercial systems. Uh, and we take a systems approach to this to show how the global food industry has supplied the market with cheap, convenient, and hyper-palatable ultra-processed foods uh, to the detriment of, of, of our health. So medical approaches to nutrition and weight often focuses, focus on what happens after swallowing, right? The metabolic effects uh, of, of what we ingest and then work backwards from there to make dietary recommendations in terms of percentages or grams. Now, some of us, and here I'm uh, underlining uh, the point that Karobi made, some of us have trained ourselves to think in terms 
of these numbers, right? Daily recommended allowances and so forth. Uh, but that's not how most people organize their diets or their cooking. Um, and that's especially true for the most marginalized among us, uh, people dealing with time poverty, financial constraints, and other sorts of stressors. For, for most people, at least some of the time, food and eating are also about love and identity as much as they are about calories and micronutrients. But of course, it's hard to translate love into grams or ounces. Uh, I won't ask you to put this in the chat, but you know, how many grams do you love your partner or your, or your kids? Uh, as an example, I often think of soda consumption in Mexico, for example. Their mothers often give even their very young children a Coke or a Pepsi to drink, much to the horror of public health uh, officials and, and nutritionists, understandably so. We, we understand the dangers of such empty calories. But for most of these mothers, this is about more than calories or nutrition. It's an expression of love and care. I mean, imagine not being able to provide what you think your kids need and deserve in life. But a soda or a snack might be a, a cheap and convenient way to express love and care, uh, a, an affordable indulgence uh, in, in trying circumstances. I think it's useful to think of these social and emotional values and meanings that get attached as cultural facts. And I use the term fact here to indicate that they're, they're just as real as scientific facts in the sense that they motivate people's behavior. They help determine what we swallow, which then leads to all of the interactions and, and, and metabolic effects of after we swallow. These are just as real as cholesterol levels, even if we can't put a number on them. But crucially, they're more malleable than these other biological facts. And this is something that food and beverage companies realize very, very well. Uh, and they use this in their marketing that plays on and sometimes even starts cultural trends. So how do we take into account these other meanings given to food uh, when we're trying to develop policies to improve nutrition? Next slide, please. One way is to follow the innovative approach taken by Brazil. And I love their dietary guidelines because they're based on 10 principles that never say what percentage of something to, you know, how many, how many calories or uh, how many grams of sugar to eat in a day, but give guiding principles that leave a lot of leeway for people to make their individual decisions. For example, their list of 10 principles, which are their dietary, their nutritional guidelines, are make minimally processed foods the basis of your diet. Avoid ultra-processed foods. Eat regularly and when possible, in the company of others. And the list goes on, but you get the idea here. They're not telling people exactly what to do, but they're building on shared values to encourage people in a particular direction. The corollary to this is their visual representations, which you see here, are not pyramids or pie charts, but they're, they're images of meals that people might actually eat. I think this is an incredibly effective way of communicating nutritional uh, guidelines uh, and something that we can learn from here in the States. So this is what we thought would be the, the clear cut cultural angle uh, to understanding uh, nutritional policy. But as we dive deeper into the research, into the obesity research, it turned out, and this is something that you know very well uh, being experts in this field, causes are not as simple is widely assumed, more calories in than calories out. That definitely plays a role. There are all kinds of other things, including genetic predispositions, the types of fat you get metabolized, the gut biome interaction is turning out to be incredibly important. Uh, and uh, even more so when we, when we, when we uh, take into account that 67% of US children's calories come from ultra processed foods, 67%. And these are foods that are engineered by food scientists working for companies that are trying to make them taste in a way that can be almost irresistible. So we need to understand not only the metabolic processes, but also how they're affected by cultural trends, cultural norms, and the global agro-industrial complex. 
even the metrics that we use are not as clear cut as, is, uh, as are often assumed, including BMI. So uh, next slide. The World Health Organization defines overweight and obesity as abnormal or excessive fat accumulation that presents a risk to health. Abnormal or excessive fat accumulation that presents a risk to health. Uh, it's a pretty standard textbook definition. It's a bit tautological. I mean, this is a this is a health problem because it causes health problems kind of thing. But the real issue is in their the following sentence to the WHO guidelines where it operationalizes this definition. A body mass index over 25 is considered overweight and over 30 is obese. Now this definition allows for, even if it doesn't highlight, our current understanding that only certain types of fat are associated with type 2 diabetes and other illnesses. Although I have to mention here, uh, the recent research by, by uh, Vinkat Nayaran and others has shown that that is true for Euro-American populations, but not true for South Asian populations. Uh, and this is part of the colonial legacy of research, really, in a way that we extrapolate out from Euro-American populations, this association of visceral fat and type 2 diabetes. Okay. So obesity is fat tissue that increases risk of illness. The problem arises, as I suggested, when we operationalize that definition in terms of BMI. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with this history. There's a very racialized history to BMI. It was developed uh, in the early 19th century by Quitlé, a, a Belgian statistician, who was really just looking for a data set to run his early statistics on and the height and weight of Belgian and Northern European males was the data set that was, that was handy. That was adopted by Ansel Keys, an epidemiologist in 1972, and rechristened as the body mass index, BMI, which has become the de facto universal standard for, for measuring body size. It's true in terms of childhood overweight and obesity, we have growth charts that are slightly different than just the standard uh, BMI uh, cutoffs of, of 25 and 30, although ultimately virtually all of those track very closely with the BMI. So BMI, a, a couple of the problems with BMI, it doesn't distinguish types of fat or distinguish between fat and other sorts of body tissue. So it's a very blunt instrument. We, we realize this. I think we all realize this. More importantly, it's a population measure. Uh, and it, it's attractive to epidemiologists because the data height and weight are very readily available. Now the classification of obesity, the, the relationship of obesity and disease is based on these population studies. And there is a clear and linear correlation in Euro-American populations, we have to say now, uh, between BMIs above 23 and risk of type 2 diabetes. In children, type 2 diabetes rates have been, have been rising along with uh, obesity rates. Absolute numbers are still, uh, are still relatively small, and the, the main implication seems to be development into adult uh, uh, obesity and uh, the type 2 diabetes risk that goes with that. So this is a population measure, but what is revealing at a population le uh, level can be a poor predictor of individual health. One study uh, found that half of overweight people were metabolically healthy, and get this, a third of normal weight people were not. We, we realize very well that 30% of adults in the United States living with obesity have type 2 diabetes, but 70% do not. The danger here, we're not saying that BMI doesn't, doesn't tell us anything, that it cannot be useful, but the danger here is that we can use BMI and weight to inadvertently pathologize all large bodies. Anyone uh, with, uh, you know, classified by their height weight as, uh, as, as obese uh, is seen as having a life-threatening disease, and even if many, or, or in some cases most, uh, do not. This measure that we know is imperfect at best as an individual diagnostic tool has taken on a life of its own though. We realize, I think intellectually, many of us realize the shortcomings of BMI and yet it is used daily 
uh, in, in clinical settings. It has become a cultural fact. People in white coats have culture too. Uh, and it's, 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 this, it, it's become a social scientific construct among healthcare providers that informs clinical care. And here's the, the dangerous part, can feed into weight discrimination and narratives about personal responsibility and self-control. Uh, Japan, for example, has reclassified obesity as a disease as quote unquote metabolic disease. And they use more precise measures lipid levels and cholesterol levels and, and, and blood pressure and so forth uh, to measure this. Uh, and I'm gonna turn it over to Tatiana now. Thanks, Ted. Yeah. Um, so as we delve into the historical construction of obesity, uh, we were also able to focus on the lived experience of obesity. And there are several studies and testimonies that provide a unique focus on how fat is understood across the globe. Uh, but also how these understandings frame the actual lives of people and particularly young people. Uh, as pre previously mentioned by Ted, our mental model of obesity is built upon the notion of energy balance. Um, unfortunately, uh, this approach um, also associates body sites with individual choices. And through different narratives of people living with obesity, we can see how um, uh, these understandings of large bodies as a personal failure, um, uh, a realization that usually comes very early in life, uh, can usually in childhood can have a long life impact. Uh, by being reduced to this one aspect of their lives, uh, their size, children living with obesity uh, face many forms of bullying, shaming, and blaming in schools, at home, and even at clinic clinical settings. And we need to recognize that shame and blame are ineffective instruments of the public health toolkit. Um, uh, activist Audrey Gordon, in her book, What We Don't Talk When We Talk About Fat, provides a very moving view of how she internalized her body, uh, or her body size as a problem at a very early age. And the quote says, I had been declared an enemy combatant in the US war on childhood obesity. But it's like money had been declared an epidemic and we were its virus personified. Weight discrimination is a serious problem and we can consider it the last bastion of acceptable discrimination. Uh, even in clinical settings, weight plays a role in how patients are treated. A study showed that 65% of um, graduate healthcare students had witnessed weight bias. And it has an indisputable impact of, of on health. Another study showed that 60%, a 60% increase in risk mortality independent of BMI for those who had experienced um, weight discrimination. So large body people often do not seek health, this is what studies show, because of the perceived stigma that they are failing to control their weight. And we found quite uh, inspiring uh, recent public policies implemented in the city of Recife in Brazil that aim at gordophobia or fat phobia through anti-bullying workshops for teachers and children, as well as modifications uh, to public trans, uh, transport infrastructure uh, that is not uh, well suited for all body types. Another aspect that we found in the narratives of uh, lived experience of obesity was the sense of being talked about rather than being part of the conversation. Uh, Patricia Nisi from the Obesity Coalition remarked how it is important to have uh, a wider representation in any discussion of obesity policies uh, and that there are many challenges to include diverse uh, voices since not all life, uh, lived experiences are the same. Uh, your race, your ethnicity, your gender, your, 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 your geographic location, um, as well as your economic situation can render very different experiences of uh, weight bias and weight shaming. Uh, and we can say the same for age. Children living with obesity rarely become part of policy task groups, even when they are the main subjects of intervention. So our report advocates for a justice framework in which all body types are uh, seen as deserving health and healthcare and emphasizes that we need 
policies that take into account how weight bias places children in more vulnerable conditions. Next slide. Um, another aspect that results from the energy balance model is the narrative that diet is an individual choice. And this framework invisibilizes uh, not only how food systems work, but also how historical and cultural legacies shape what we eat. Um, the, the conventional model uh, rarely addresses uh, the history that shapes uh, culinary repertoires across the globe. And in our report, we use an example sugar as the first global processed food facilitated by the European invasion of many territories and the displacement of people for indenture and slave labor. Sugar still shapes uh, the lives of many people across the globe, not only uh, because of how it is produced, but also uh, through its wide availability in ultra processed foods. Uh, a study about um, diabetes in, Bel in Belize uh, show that people still face the aftermath of sugar production, even when it's no longer uh, a main export, uh, through fields that are uh, exposed to toxic agricultural enhancers, but also because of the reduced fresh food availability, the dependence of imported goods, and the private health services all of which result in increased metabolic disease. Structural inequality and historical racism uh, has shaped culinary repertoires, and many times making the cheapest and most accessible foods a common feature in, in tables across marginalized populations. And as Ted mentioned, a source of pleasure and comfort. However, it is not only uh, food availability which has been impacted by these global historical processes. Uh, we address how displacement and colonization deprive people from worldviews that tie food into spiritual practices and agricultural knowledge. As Mapihi Raharuhi, a Maori public health official in New Zealand reminds us, colonization forced out the practice of our religion, which is linked to our prayers, which is linked to the way we grow food, which is linked to the way that we bring our children up, which is linked to the way that we interact with each other. This damaged the ability for Maori to be Maori, and we are feeling the impacts of it today. Black, indigenous, and people of color across the globe are making important efforts to revitalize their food waste and move beyond this focus on uh, individual choice. We looked at how Crow and Sunni nations are implemented programs based on food sovereignty that build on traditional food practices and approach childhood nutrition from a holistic uh, perspective, but still this is an uphill battle. Uh, we also found recounts of nutritional interventions shaming cultural foods, uh, particularly the choices of ethnic people or, popula or poor populations, uh, many times labeling uh, their food choices as unhealthy. Without the recognition of how cultural history and structural co uh, constrictions can play a role in all of our food choices. So we need wider palettes that recognize all traditions as we build upon um, healthier uh, food options. Uh, and this is made even more difficult by uh, global food, the interest of global food corporations, cheap and convenient processed food alternatives are easily replacing local foods across the globe. And just to provide you with an example of my home country in Guatemala, where half of the children under uh, five years of age are undernourished. Almost 60 people live uh, under poverty and we don't have any public uh, spaces or parks. McDonald's has just opened its 100th restaurant with the largest children playground in Central America. So we need policies that also address the responsibility of uh, global food, uh, food systems. And uh, yeah, next slide, please. Uh, so, as a system's approach to food, uh, body size and infant health can provide a way to address this complexity at hand. And we found several studies introducing systems analysis to global and local, uh, local food waste. Um, we implemented with Vanderbilt students, uh, a group of Vanderbilt students uh, led by Hey Motzinger, a, a systems map approach which places child health 
and nutrition in a network of economic disparities, with environment, systems of care, and um, stigma, time poverty, racism. Uh, we also found very uh, interesting examples from the city's changing diabetes program in Amsterdam that has coordinated policy efforts between government, civil society, and the private sector. Um, so we need, uh, so while global guidelines might be difficult to come by, we encourage a community approach that can address food waste in a more systemic uh, view. And that can send, uh, decenter the role of indi the individual and place us all in a network with each other. Next slide, please. So just to recapitulate, uh, our report focuses on three uh, cultural insights that food is more than nutrition, that health is more than weight, and the diet is more than individual choice. Uh, and we hope to encourage that all efforts to improve child health and nutrition take into account the cultural context, the colonial legacies, as well as the nutritional science. And there are some of our info for the report and our work. And I give the uh, stage to Jamie now. Great. Thanks so much, Tatiana and Ted. That was fantastic. So um, the work that you just heard about, I think really represents this perfect confluence of the foundation's global work and our childhood obesity work. So hopefully you can tell why Karobi articulated early on how excited we were to be able to support this. Um, so I suspect that many of you listening in today are familiar with the foundation's two decades long, almost two decades long commitment to an investment in childhood obesity prevention. And I'll say I think we as a field have learned a ton over the last two decades. I think today we understand that in order to make further progress to address childhood obesity, we really need a deliberate focus on addressing the many social, economic, and physical factors that contribute to obesity, including the long-standing structural racism that exists across all the systems that circumscribe our lives. And indeed, as you heard today, food is about more than nutrition, health is about more than weight, and diet is certainly about more than just individual choice. Next slide, please. So as I think about um, our work in the obesity prevention space, and you can do a couple clicks so that uh, the slide gets populated. So as I think about the foundation's work in the obesity prevention space, I think it's fair to say that much of our early work, and you heard about the energy balance equation from um, Ted, I think early on, but much of our early work really focused on and emphasized systems change tied to childhood obesity as an indicator. But today we're really moving to thinking about obesity, not so, I'm sorry, tied to obesity as an outcome, but today we're really moving to thinking about obesity as indicator and not outcome. And this is a pretty major shift for us. I think it moves us from thinking about obesity as a siloed issue and set of investments towards really thinking about it as a key symptom of community conditions and systemic inequities. So as we reimagine what a post COVID and racially just society could look like, fair and equitable access to and affordability of healthy food choices for all seems ever more consequential to the dialogue around building a culture of health. So now feels like a really opportune time for us at the foundation to be evolving our longstanding focus on childhood obesity to really think about advancing a more just food system. The work of Ted and Tatiana and their extended team, I think offers us a really important roadmap for moving the field of childhood obesity prevention upstream and lays out opportunities that arise when we consider the interactions of cultural systems, physiological systems, and commercial systems. So this work is absolutely influencing our thinking at RWJ as we look at charting our path forward in the obesity space and the food justice space. Next slide, please. And I just wanted to take a moment to lift up one of the very specific examples of how the cultural contexts, 
context of health and well being is informing our thinking. So the State of Childhood Obesity Report, which I hope many of you are familiar with, um, it's our most prominent communications milestone, if you will, and has been for the last few years. Our report this year um, is gonna look a bit different. Um, and the new report, Reframing Childhood Obesity, um, has certainly helped us think about this forthcoming release. So to meaningfully explain the foundation's evolution, we're gonna be producing and publishing our fourth annual communications to the field, the state of childhood obesity, health is more than weight, which will reflect where we have been regarding childhood obesity, what we've learned um, regarding the impacts of bias and stigma and the evolution towards a food justice focus. And I wanna thank Ted, Tatiana and the extended team at Vanderbilt for really helping us to think about how cultural insights and global examples can help improve health policy around childhood obesity. So um, thank you to the team. And I think at this point, I am supposed to turn it back over to our host. Thank you so much, Jamie, and thank you to all of our fantastic speakers today. We have just a few minutes for Q&A, and so we would like to open things up for your questions or comments in the Q&A box, so please be sure to put them there. You'll see that on your Zoom toolbar. Look for Q&A, and you can add them there, and we'll get to as many questions as we can. We've got about five minutes or so for questions now. And we already have a couple uh, who, that have been submitted. So let me go to those. And let me ask first uh, the, the question, what advice do you give to backpack programs which provide selected items to children to take home and eat over the weekend? These programs eliminate choice and context, but provide food to insecure families. Wow, that's a great question. And it's there is this balance. I mean, as, as the question implies, we have to be pragmatic, right? Sometimes kids just need some food and we need to supply it. Uh, I think, and you jump in here, Tatiana, uh, I, I think that the most important thing that we would suggest in this way is to really work with what the local local norms would be and even what kids want. This is something that Tatiana has really stressed. It's important to have children's voices at the table. Tatiana, do you want to say something? Yeah, I think we, uh, from the studies that we've seen and some of the particularly uh, like ground-based uh, projects, we, what we find is communities asking for their input in whatever is given to, to, to children, right? So uh, incorporating uh, these discussions into the public policies or interventions as a, as a common practice, I think can, can help uh, provide, I don't know, new perspectives. And also perhaps engaging in, even if, if you give um, uh, an item, whether it can be prepared in a way that is culturally relevant or that can be, uh, I don't know, re uh, signified within the family, within what what their practices are. Um, so I don't know. I, I I would go that way for now. So another question uh, that has been submitted is: Does anyone think that we're perpetuating the stigma against bodies with extra fat by continuing to reinforce the idea that obesity is quote a disease and quote an epidemic? The idea of the obesity epidemic caught fire and spread rapidly when CDC published a report in JAMA in March 2004, claiming that, quote, obesity was, quote, killing 400,000 Americans a year and that it was becoming America's number one preventable death. Um, but there, and then the, the question goes on to, to point out some flaws in the research methodology. Um, but uh, ends with any thoughts to, to share on this. I, I won't read the, the whole thing here, but, um, but this is a big question. Panelists, do you have some thoughts on, on this language and this issue? Uh, I'll, I'll jump in again real quick, uh, just to say, thanks for bringing that up. This is, uh, it's an important question. And it, it, there are those who advocate stopping calling obesity a disease and an epidemic. And I think there's a lot to be said for that. 
at the same time, we have to be careful, right? A lot of this is all in the balance that we, we want to recognize increased risk levels. Uh, and yet stigmatization really harms healthcare as well. And so how do we balance those? I do think, and I will say, uh, and Tatiana, again, jump in, uh, based on our review of, of lots of people living in large bodies, personal experiences, uh, many, many see the disease uh, classification as, as being pejorative. At the same time, it arose to combat discrimination, right? In the same sense that alcoholism uh, was reclassified as a disease and not a moral failing. And so the advocates for the disease model really say that, right? That it's, it recognizes that it's not just self-control and, and moral will. Uh, so that's a bit of a mealy answer, but I think your question is right on. And the stats that you cite are exactly right. People are really, you see all kinds of numbers about how many people die from obesity, even if obesity is never the cause of death on a, on a death certificate. I, we have I would just add, Karen, if it's okay, I think Ted said it really well. I just finished um, a book, a memoir called Belly of the Beast by Deshaun Harrison. And I think it's a really important piece specifically about this. And it talks about the societal and systemic bias and marginalization, marginalization that people living in larger bodies have to navigate. And it absolutely implicates the CDC um, report from a while back. So it's a really real issue. Um, we at our RWJ are sort of doing a lot of introspection and interrogating how we have likely and inadvertently contributed to some of the biased mental model and stigmatization. So I think it's a really important conversation that we're having. And I would just add that. And I just have to give a, I have to chime in and say, I have been so impressed with Robert Wood Johnson's approach to structural racism, to obesity, in so many areas, they're really leading the pack here. And so hats off. You've got a big enough endowment. You don't have to do that, but you do. Thank you so much. We are, we're nearly out of time. We may have a moment for one very brief uh, answer to a question. I'm gonna choose, we can, let me just say that we've gotten a number of excellent questions here. And I apologize that we will not be able to get to all of them. But let me ask this, what steps do you think that current pediatric obesity interventions could take to ground treatment in cultural insights from various communities? How can we, how can we bring culture into the clinic? I think the first step is an awareness of the negative effects of weight discrimination uh, is, is the biggest thing and really being sensitive uh, to that in a, in a clinical setting. And beyond that, again, engaging the people that we wanna help and trying to understand what food means in their lives, both specifically the types of food that are culturally or religiously important uh, and just sort of their cultural preferences. So I don't, there's no, we don't, I don't have an easy one size fits all answer to that but along those lines. Uh, Can I, if I could just jump in and, and just say, I think I, I totally agree with what Ted said. And I think actually the step before that is just recognizing that these, that, that culture exists, that there are cultural influences it, that, that, ex, that are very much present in a clinical encounter. We often think that, that that those are somehow devoid of culture. They're not, that exists. That relationship is laden with all sorts of cultural implications with power and hierarchy and culture in terms of an understanding those webs of meanings of you tell me, you know, I need to eat this or that. Well, you know, that has a particular meaning in, in, in as I understand it. And so just recognizing that culture is there, it exists and it's powerfully influential in these encounters uh, to me would be the first step. Excellent. That's beautifully said. Can I jump in and just say uh, to another question about federally funded nutrition assistance programs, follow Jamie's Twitter. Uh, she has a lot to say about uh, federal nutrition programs. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you so much. And we had 
a number of questions in the chat asking about how to get in touch with all of you, how to submit ideas for, obesity, for childhood obesity interventions and other questions like that. And so let me say to all of you in the audience who asked those questions, we're gonna be giving you some contact information in just a moment where you can reach out to us and we can put you in touch with the panelists or, or give you ways to, to be in touch with them. So uh, we will definitely, um, definitely be interested in hearing from you and connecting you. That is what uh, webinars like today's are all about. So I want to say again, thank you so much to all of our presenters and to the audience for the questions and comments. Uh, we have some announcements and contact information that we want to share with you so that you can access other resources that NCORE has that may be helpful in the work that you do. Uh, so first, I want to uh, alert you to a few new peer-reviewed articles that NCORE has just published. And the links to these articles are going to be in the chat box in a moment. Um, the first one is Key Informant Interviews to Inform Nutrition and Physical Activity Recovery Efforts in Child Care Settings Amid the COVID-19 Pandemic in the United States. The second one, improve active Improving Active Travel to School and Its Surveillance and Overlooked Opportunity in Health Promotion and Chronic Disease Prevention. And also, a systemic review on quantifying pedestrian injury when evaluating changes to the built environment. So you can be on the lookout for those articles and follow the links in the chat to get to those. Uh, in addition, NCORE has released two new resources we want to tell you about. The first one is the Youth Active Travel to School Initiative. It aims to improve the public health surveillance of youth active travel to school across three content areas, youth behaviors, environmental supports, and program and policy supports. The second resource that you'll want to take a look at is a new website called Create Thriving Activity Friendly Communities. And there you can find talking points and resources to make the case for investments in activity friendly communities. Also coming in the fall, NCORE is going to be publishing an online economic indicators library that you can use to help you decide which economic indicators to prioritize based on your community's most pressing local issues and its vision for the future. So for more information about any of these resources, you can again follow the links in the chat. Also, we want to be sure that if you are not already signed up for NCORE newsletters that you do that. You can find that link in the chat as well. It is incore.org forward slash e hyphen newsletter. And we would love for you to sign up for those and to especially be on the lookout for the Encore Student Hub webpage. Um, and, and so again, by signing up for Encore newsletters and alerts, you'll be connected to that, um, to that resource as well. And last but not least, please do reach out to us. Let us know if you're using any of the NCORE tools that we have talked about. Let us know if you are using any of the ideas that you heard from our panelists today, or if you have ideas for them and want to reach out. You can send all of that to us at the NCORE Coordinating Center. That email address is NCORE at fhi360.org. You'll see it there in the chat. And if you write to us and let us know how you're using some of these ideas, we might even feature your story in an upcoming webinar. So we are at time and that's all we have for you today. But again, if you have further questions about NCORE, its resources or any upcoming activities, you can reach out to the NCORE Coordinating Center at NCORE at fhi360.org. Again, thank you so much to these amazing speakers today. And thank you to all of you in the audience for joining us for the Connect and Explore webinar. Have a great day, and we hope to see you at our next event. Thank you. Bye-bye.